This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. I'm so excited to have our guest today, Rob Riggle. Rob, welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited for you to be here. Um, I'm excited to chat today, but I first want to introduce you to our audience for those that may be unfamiliar. Of course, most of us know you as a comedian for your roles on The Daily Show, on Comedy Central, and all of your movies, including Step Brothers, 21 Jump Street. I could go on and on and on. And biggest fans also may know you as the guy who shot Bin Laden. Uh, I watched that video again the other day and was cracking up. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. But what people don't always know is that you're also a Marine with over 20 years of service. And that I would say is kind of what brought us together. You've been involved with some stuff with the Travis Manning Foundation for a few years now, and you're a big advocate for the military. Um, you're out in California, but you have not forgotten the importance of service and making sure that you're paying homage to the men and women who serve. And I love that about you. Um, so we're super excited to have you on and dive into all of that today. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, at your disposal. All right. Well, let's get into it. So I want to start off a little bit with your background. You're, you're from Kansas, which if you're a fan of Rob Riggle, you know that he is from Kansas. Um, you know that he is a big Kansas football fan. And um, you ended up going to... KU for college. I did. Okay. So you're there. And I read that while you're there, you're interested not in the Marines first, but in the FBI. Is that correct? Yeah, it was, it was one of the initial thoughts I had. Um, Cause you know, uh, I was young and I was, I was a pretty average student. Uh, I wasn't anything exceptional. And I was sitting there thinking, God, what do I want to do with my life? Cause that's the first time I ever asked that question. And you know, I had a wild thought about the uh, FBI. I thought, you know, that, that's something that has real purpose. And, you know, that, that, that's something I could be proud of. And it just kind of appealed to me for some reason. So I called the FBI and I said, what do you, you know, what are you guys looking for? How do you, what's, what's path should I be on? And they said, we're looking for lawyers and accountants. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm out. Uh, as, you know, so I was like, what else you got? And they were like, well, we, we, we really, we, we recruit a lot of Marine Corps officers. And I thought, shebang, how about that? Because serving uh, in the military was always something I had thought about doing. Um, you know, I, 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 it's just one of those things was a, 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 that I had in the back of my mind. But that was the kind of the, the catalyst that pushed me in that direction, so to speak. So do you go into the ROTC program at Kansas or do you wait till you graduate? No, I went through the PLC okay. program. Okay. Uh, platoon leader's course. So I went while I was an undergrad. Um, and I had some buddies of mine um, that had gone through the PLC program. And um, so, you know, they, I was lucky because they were older than me and they could explain some things to me and they introduced me to the recruiter and, you know, they kind of help with that path. Um, so it was PLC for me. And then after you graduate, you're in Quantico. Correct. Correct. I graduate. Um, I'd finished P. I'd finished uh, officer candidate school already, so I was done with OCS. I graduated uh, December eighteenth. I took my commission December twentieth, and January third, I was in Quantico at the basic school. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. So you're at Quantico, and you're at the basic school, and you're thinking you want to be a pilot. Yeah, well, that's one of the things. I had my pilot's license when I was in college, when I was at KU. Um, 
So I, I, you know, I used to fly a Cessna 172 all over. Um, and it, by the way, learning how to fly in Kansas is great. The whole state is a huge runway. So if anything goes wrong, you just put it down in any field. You know, it, was, it was a very <laughs> safe place to learn how to fly. I never, I never was scared. Um, but I would fly all over, you know, I would take my buddies and we'd go fly out to Manhattan to see a KUK state game or fly down to Norman, Oklahoma or, you know, wherever. Um, so I got a lot of, a lot of flying, uh, in, and then, uh, I took a, a test that AQT FAR, I don't know, a lot of acronyms, but, um, I did well enough that I, I got a, I got a flight contract with the Marines. So that's how I started. And one of the things I read that was really cool that your grandfather, Served in the Army Air Corps, Air, Air Corps during World War II, which coincidentally, so did my grandfather. Um, oh, wow. He paid for your flying lessons. That's right. And I thought that was really, um, that was neat. And um, you are in, you're active duty. How long do you stay active duty with the Marine Corps? I did a total of nine years active duty, a total of nine, and then 14 in the reserves for a total 23. So where are you uh, stationed during those nine years? What do those nine years look like for you as a as young officer, first lieutenant, Rob Riggle? Quantico, Pensacola, Corpus Christi, um, and then um, Indianapolis, Cherry Point, back and forth between Cherry Point and Lejeune, because I was, I would, I would be attached to different units. So I was with the second MA, second Marine Air Wing, but um, I would I would get, I was sent on like special mag tafts to Liberia. I was attached to 2-2, I was attached to 3-8, just depending on what the needs of the Marine Corps were. Right. Um, so I spent a lot of time in Eastern North Carolina. Then from there, I, I was sent to New York City, um, which was uh, great. Uh, because that that really helped open the door for me to pursue comedy and acting, which was another passion of mine that I always wanted to pursue or try. Um, so that allowed that allowed that to happen, so to speak. So when you're in the Marine Corps, because I love this, you know, I, I find it fascinating with both your journey. And then I also um, super interested in Adam Driver, who's a, a big actor and sure. was a Marine. Um always a Marine, but, um, you know, I always wonder about this idea. You go from really one end of the spectrum to the other. It's like <laughs> Marines to Hollywood. Yeah. And so how does that transition happen for you? Not so much in logistically, but you've had a passion for comedy. Um, when do you start recognizing in those nine years while you're in the Marine Corps, you know, this may be something I want to do as I leave active duty? To be honest, I think it was there, the desire to pursue comedy and acting and that passion or that bug, that seed was already there uh, when I started my journey in the Marine Corps. So I think it was, it's always been there. It wasn't something I discovered during those nine years on active duty. I think it was something that was always there that finally pushed through to the surface uh, and was like, you know, put some sunlight on this and give it a shot. And so that's, that's, that's how it did. And, and, you know, part of me was just scared to do it. You know, I, uh, I, I come from the Midwest. I have a very traditional family, you know, I, I was serving the Marine Corps. And even though there was a passion to try it and do it, you know, I was, uh, it was, it was one of the most terrifying things I ever did was getting on that stage. I, I can only imagine. And I, I wonder, you know, how you get to that point where as you're growing up, is it, Rob, you're pretty funny. You know, is it, is it, does it start out that way? Because for a comedian, like, how do you determine I want to do comedy? Right? Like I can, Honestly, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think it, it comes down to that. It, you know, you, um, comedy is the, I like comedy the best because it's instantaneous feedback. You know, whether or not it's working right away. Um, and the audience lets you know, and growing up, I would always be able, I could always make my friends laugh. I could always make, uh, my family laugh um, and not by, you know, doing pratfalls or whatever, but I would, I could make light of a situation, right? You know, there's all kinds of different ways to be funny. There's, um, you know, like when people say class clown, I always kind of get turned off by that because to me, a class clown was very disruptive, probably a bully, 
you know, that kind of stuff. I, that was not my thing. I like to do more um, comedy bits, so to speak. So like in high school, I was a, a DJ at lunchtime and I would do fake, inter fake interviews with myself because I was in a booth, no one could see me, right? So I would, I would say, hey, we've got uh, this guy from this, you know, band Halloween, which was this ridiculous Dutch heavy metal band that the album was one of the funniest things I ever saw. They looked ridiculous. So, and, his, and the name, the, the guys in the band were called Ingo and Kai and just these, it was like, anyway, they were ridiculous. So I would say, hey, we got Halloween on the phone and I would interview Kai and Ingo, but I would be Kai and Ingo, you know? And, and then, you know, I would, you know, on the back of the announcements, it would say in all capital letters, do not read. And it was the teacher absence, you know, uh, for that day. Right. And, and so I would, I would speculate on where Mr. Mincer was or where, which is where Mrs. Crow was, or, you know, I would just say, Oh, Mr. Mention's not here. I wonder where he is. I bet he had a big, big weekend, you know, she, you know, Royals game, drinking beer in left field or whatever it was. But I would just do things like that. Um, I also did some, some sort of naughty things. I, so I would, I remember, <laughs> I would remember I, uh, I would say, uh, okay, up next, we've got some more, you know, night Ranger, you know, and I'd play, you know, I'd, I'd start the song. Right. And then I'd put the microphone down, but I'd leave the master level up and I'd start cussing, uh, you know, to my buddy. I'd be like, oh, man, can you believe this horse shit? Nah, nah, nah. And I'd say something, you know, I'm sorry if I cussed on your thing. No, it's fine. Say, you know, uh, I would say something terrible like that, but it would go out over lunch. So everybody in the cafeteria could hear me, you know, cussing. Well, then I could hear the clickety clack of, of high heels of, of, uh, of, of our teacher running down the hallway going, the microphone's still on, the microphone's still on. And she'd come in, the microphone. I go, what? Oh, gosh. Oh, oh, God. And I'd turn it down. I go, I'm sorry. She goes, guys, you got to be more careful. You know, <laughs> it's the third time this week. And I'd be like, I'm sorry. It's just, I forget, always forget the master. She goes, and you guys cuss so much. Don't do that. on like. But we knew what we were doing. Yeah. It was just a bit, you know? And so, so anyway, comedy is always a, 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 it's a very fair instrument. You know whether or not it's working. So, um, so when, when you get enough feedback that says, hey, you're pretty good at this, or hey, you're funny, or you have a proclivity for it, you tend to pursue it a little more. You tend to nurture it. You tend to water that garden. And then you finally get enough courage to take it for a walk on stage and see if it really works or if you're just kidding yourself. And then when you go on stage and you actually get some positive feedback, you're like, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I could do this. And then you you try it a little more and you do it a little more. It's, it's, um, and then it becomes a passion because when, when it, when you, when you do it and you do it well and it works, um, it really does feel, it's like a high. It, it feels really great, uh, to, to do that. So, uh, then you become really passionate about it and, and then it kind of takes a life of its own. And by the way, like if it's not going well and if it's, you get that feedback too, you know, um, and, and you, you, you have to adjust for it. Now, if, if I was doing it for a couple of years in New York and nobody was enjoying it, I, I could get the message. I'm, I'm not without social cues. I understand how the world works, well, but I wasn't. I was actually getting good feedback. Yeah, and I wonder about that. And I actually, because I do a, a lot of public speaking and I'll never forget one of the earliest speeches that I gave. It was probably actually the first time I got up in front of a large group after my brother was killed and they asked me to talk about Travis. It was at his high school. And so I went to his high school and I wrote a 45 minute speech and it was a speech. I didn't ad lib at all. And I didn't want to talk about Travis the whole time. And so I share this story a lot because I wrote the speech, but I wanted to talk about Travis and what he stood for as a Marine and what he stood for in terms of leadership. So I started pulling out all these other examples of leadership and I shared some stories about Travis's friends and I shared a story about George Washington and the ultimate example of leadership being that he retired back to Mount Vernon and asked others to step forward. And I thought, what a great way to explain to young kids that you don't need a title or a position to be a leader. And I remember I read the speech to my dad and he was like, this is great. And, you know, that George Washington piece on leadership, it's fantastic. And I'm like, I know, I love it. And so I go, I give the speech. And afterwards, the principal at the school, he said, you know, 
this is a message that transcends beyond the walls of just Travis's high school. I'd love to pass it on. Would you speak at more schools? And I'm like, absolutely sign me up. And it was electric when I first got up there. Like I felt it. I felt this passion where I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this. And so I know what you're talking about, that getting up on stage. And I said, listen, I'd love to know what the kids thought, obviously. Like, of course, the adults loved it. My dad loved it. I said, let me know what the kids thought. And he said, okay, we can, we can certainly gauge the, the kids. And he called me a few days later and he said, you know, the kids loved hearing stories about Travis, obviously, this kid who walked the halls of the school they're in now. And they loved hearing stories about his friends. And I said, okay, was there anything that they didn't like? And he said, you know, they didn't love that story about George Washington. And so like, that was my feedback days later. But I wonder as a, a comedian, you know, you know, in that moment, you, you tell that joke and it doesn't land and you instantly know. And I'd love to know, like, was there a time that you can remember where you said something doing stand up where it just didn't land? Like, and what do you do in that moment? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think any anybody who's ever worked in comedy has if you haven't bombed, you haven't you haven't done comedy. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Um, and it, it's terrible. It's it's just, oh, it's the worst. It's the worst feeling in the world. Uh, and all you can do is smile and move on and 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 go, OK, duly noted. I need to work on that one or I need to come up with a better because that's what it is. You're always it's like whittling. You're always trying to make it better. You know, you're always sculpting it down to to what it could be. So the first time you, you try something, yeah, you know, maybe the premise is there or maybe the punchline is there, but the verbiage could be different. And when you change the verbiage, all of a sudden the joke that didn't land the night before is now your your bet is your closing joke. So it's. It, it's, it is a process. It's, it's all about whittling down. But the instantaneous feedback is always great because there's no director, there's no producers, there's no editor. It's just you and um, the audience and a microphone. And do so you think you know. about, do you acknowledge it in the moment? Because I would imagine that if I told a joke and nobody laughed or you got the booze, are you like, all right, that one didn't work for you. I, I understand that. Or do you just kind of move on and move to the next joke and hope that that one hits? It, it depends. It really does. It depends on the crowd. It depends on how relaxed they are. If, you know, if, if they're relaxed, and it depends on you. If you're relaxed enough, you know, you can, you can acknowledge in the moment like, ah, all right, duly noted. And, uh, <laughs> didn't like that one, huh? And, and move on. But you always just move on. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't want to dwell on it too much because it sucks. Um, and then, you know, I haven't done stand-up in so long because uh, I was more of an improv and sketch comedian. That was kind of my bread and butter. Um, but while I was on The Daily Show, I shared an office with John Oliver, and he used to drag me to comedy clubs to do stand-up with him, and, and I didn't know how to do it, really. I hated doing it. Um, so I started building a set then, and that's, I did stand-up for a, a brief window, probably, what, five years? Um, and it was fine. Uh, but it, it's a painful process, no doubt about it. Yeah. So let's get back to the Marine Corps a little bit because sure. you're in the Marine Corps, you're thinking about comedy, but as a Marine, and I don't think you even have to know too much about the Marine Corps or military service in general to, you know, the idea of it, of, of it isn't a bunch of funny guys, right? Uh, you know, it's a serious profession. So are you known as the funny guy in the Marines? Is that something that comes out in your personality? Yeah, people, people are curious about that. And to be honest with you, I always, uh, I always kind of separated those two worlds. Um, I, I didn't cross the streams too much on that because I, I took being a Marine very seriously and it is a serious profession. And I never wanted my Marines to think I was some goofball who wasn't focused or didn't understand my job or wasn't proficient in my job and my responsibilities. Now, did that mean I changed my personality and became somebody I'm, I'm not? No, because that's not natural. And you have to be, you have to be yourself too. You have to, uh, that's what connects you to other people. They have to know that you're genuine. So yeah, I was myself, uh, you know, I'm a pretty gregarious guy um, and, and, and pretty joyful guy. But, um, but yeah, no, I, when, you know, when, when it was time to be a, a leader of Marines, I was a leader of Marines. And when, when it was time to, you know, relax, then I 
relaxed. Um, but I never, I, I, I don't think I ever, even though I wore multiple hats, I don't think I ever changed my personality. Yeah. I just, I just, I, I knew time and place. There's a time and place for everything. So yeah. I just knew, I could, I always knew when it was time and place to do whatever I was doing. Absolutely. Let's talk about what, what year do you leave active duty? Uh, I left active duty in 2000. 2000. So, wow, 2000, not having any idea what's going to happen the following year. And do you immediately decide as you're leaving active duty? I also found this very interesting that you're going to do the reserves. Do you go right into the reserves? I had worked with my last active duty station was in New York City, and, and I had worked with the reserve unit there. We'd always do this uh, East Coast symposium, and it was, you know, so I worked with that reserve unit, and I got to know that unit pretty well. And uh, the Marines in that unit were, you know, I, I thought they were outstanding. They were all outstanding Marines. So I was like, I just thought they were a good unit. And they asked, you know, they said, are you, what are you going to do when you leave active? I said, well, I don't know, you know, I, I try to be an actor comedian. Um, and the CEO was like, well, you ought to think about joining the unit. So I did. Uh, and so that's what I did. I joined that, I joined that unit because it was right there in Manhattan. You know, making the drills was, was not a challenge. It was very easy to make my drills there. Um, so, so that, that's what happened. And then, uh, um, so then cut to, uh, a year later, nine 11 happens. I'm in New York, right there in Manhattan, uh, working in Midtown and, um, uh, nine 11 happens. My, my unit being the only reserve unit in Manhattan proper, um, we were activated that night of September 11th. Yeah. Um, and my CEO calls and said, all right, boots and utes, report down to one police plaza tomorrow morning and we'll, we'll go from there. I don't know what we're going to be doing. No one knows really anything yet, but we're, you know, we assume that there could be hundreds or thousands of people trapped under all that rubble. We didn't know. Right. No knew. So, um, so that's what we did. My unit reported down there. Uh, they gave us these little thin surgical masks and, uh, uh, which we all took off because you couldn't breathe. So we, we went down and uh, I guess it would have been the southwest, southeast corner of Tower One is where my bucket brigade was. Because <clears throat> they had about six stories of rubble um, around Ground Zero. And, and they couldn't bring in heavy machinery because they were afraid of cave-ins or collapses. And um, they... Uh, uh, like I said, we thought there were survivors. We just didn't know. It was, it was there was so much uh, underground in the subways and, and in the subterranean. So, and, and what was also scary too is that there was a lot of the buildings that surrounded the Twin Towers were damaged. Um, you know, I think even the next day, one of the, another building like World Trade Center three or four or five went down. Yep. There was another huge one where Brooks Brothers in the, is in the basement there. Uh, it looked like, uh, Godzilla had clawed out the front of the building and it was where, you know, some of the tower had just gutted part of that. Well, that building became unstable, but time was of the essence. So everybody's down there in the bucket brigades, just 12 hours on, 12 hours off, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, just passing bucket brigade all day. And, you know, that went on for about six days, you know, um, and then I think they declared it no longer search and rescue, but more search and recovery. So at that point, they could bring in heavy equipment. Um, uh, you know, and, and like when we were working, you know, they would stop, they'd blow a whistle and everybody would stop working and you could hear a pin drop and they would lower listening devices into the rubble to see if they could hear anything, any banging or anything. And they couldn't and they pull it up and then we'd go back to work, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, I did my time there. And then when they pulled us off the rubble pile after they declared it search and recovery, I went to one police plaza and worked uh, there until September 30th um, doing the um, um, military civilian coordination, um, uh, coordinating efforts with, with our military. At that point, uh, I had a pretty high security clearance and obviously I was a, I was a captain. My country was just attacked. I'm pretty mad. Um, so I volunteered to go back on active duty and it didn't take long. Central command picked me up 
um, on November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday, uh, is one of my orders. And uh, I reported on November 17th to Central Command down in Tampa. And November 30th, I was on a plane to Afghanistan. So, I mean, it was boom, 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 20 days uh, from the time I got my orders to the time I was on a plane to Afghanistan in 2001. So that's why I'm always, you know, that's why I'm like, that's why you have a reserve. You know, that's why the reserves are around, you know. Um, but uh, so then I, I was back on active duty for a, a year uh, and then uh, came back to New York after my a year. That was my ninth year. So I'd done eight and then that, that was my ninth. That year. was in your ninth. And, and how long are you in Afghanistan? Um, I went twice. The first time was three months and the second time was two months. So what are you thinking? You know, I love to talk to people about because each and every one of us had a different experience on September 11th, but we all knew where we were that day. We all knew, you know, what was happening to the best of our abilities, but we knew that something, something big had happened. Right. And then I talk a lot about September 11th and then September 12th. And on September 12th, you think about where our country was. And I can find no other time in my lifetime where I felt that our country was more united than it was on September 12th. And that sense of just unity, we're all in this together, whatever it is, we haven't, we don't have all the pieces figured out yet, but whatever it is, we're going to, we're going to get through it together. And I can't help but think what you're going through at ground zero on September 12th. I mean, there has to be a thousand things running through your head. Like, are you thinking right away? I'm, I'm volunteering back for active duty right away. Like, um, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. It, it, it was pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and then, then when you spend time down there, it just got more solidified every day. And I, I was like, I'm, I mean, the military is not some separate um, organism, you know, we're all Americans. And, and I, I was feeling every emotion that every American was feeling. Um, I felt violated. I felt like you would just been sucker punched. Um, I felt uh, fear. I felt anger. Um, my heart broke for all those families, um, all those people in the buildings, all the people on the planes, because as they started to profile them, you know, they were me. It, it could have so easily been me or someone I cared about or someone I loved. So, you know, there was a lot of emotions, a lot of strong emotions. Uh, like I said, all those things, all those dark wolf type emotions, the fear, the anger, the, the pain. Um, and, you know, I think, I think President Bush at the time said something that was very powerful. He said, uh, uh, you know, somebody today lost the most important person in their life. And that's, that, that resonated with me a lot. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful for sure. I, you know, I try to think back when on September 11th, I was in college and my brother was at the Naval Academy and my dad was, um, and getting back, my dad did 11 years active duty, 19 years in the reserve. And he tells anybody if you do over five years active duty, stick it out, join the reserves. And he, he's a big advocate for the reserves. So, um, but he, his uh, duty station was the Pentagon um, and he worked for Johnson and Johnson and they were actually out that day um, doing a beautification project up in North Jersey with United Way. And my mom called me and I was a college kid asleep, literally asleep, had no idea what was going on. And she calls me screaming, like, get up, wake up, something's happening. And I turned on the TV as the second plane um, hit the towers. And I was like, oh, my God, what is happening right now? And my mom was just screaming. I can't get a hold of your father. He's not answering his phone. And um your brother called me and said, they don't know if they're moving them. And I can't, I don't, you know, you, you can't just call a kid at the Naval Academy and say, what's going on, you know? And, and at that time, 
you're seeing that there, there, there's planes going everywhere. It's hitting the Pentagon and it's like, all right, where, where are these planes going to hit? And so she's freaking out and I don't know what to do with myself. I'm outside of Philadelphia in my apartment, like, okay, well, I guess I'll go to class. And I went to my English class and the professor, I'll never forget. He said, you know, something big has happened today. We don't know what it is, but it just doesn't feel appropriate to talk prose and Emily Dickinson right now. So pull out your notebook and just start writing and write whatever you want to write. And, um, I wrote, I just started writing about, you know, my dad's in the military and my brother's going to be in the military. And does this mean we're going to war? I don't understand. And, and the last thing I wrote on that paper was, uh, if, if we go to war and my brother or my dad, something happens to them, I'll never be able to go on. And I found that paper several years later, um, like shoved into a old college textbook. And it was after Travis had been killed in Iraq. And, you know, the significance of what I had written that day was obviously so much more in the aftermath of what had happened with, with our family. Um, but I just, I think back to that time and just, you know, how I wasn't directly affected on September 11th, but what happened that day changed the course of my life. And I think that it changed the course of, you know, most Americans' lives in in one way, shape, or form. And it was just such a pivotal time for our country. And I I look at where we are now and where we are now as a country. And, you know, I try to identify how can we get back to that sense of unity? Um, because listen, there weren't good things going on. It was tough stuff that we were dealing with. I mean, it was we had been attacked, our country had been attacked, but somehow we found this way to say we're all in it together. And I don't feel like we've ever gotten back to that place since that day, September 12th. And, you know, who am I? But I often think about how we can find our way back to that sense of unity that we were experiencing as a country. Um, Yeah, you know, and and that's interesting because I remember September 12th like you do. I remember the unity. I remember... I remember Congress uh, singing God Bless America Mm -hmm. on the steps. You know, I remember, you know, that's a lot of R and D's together singing God Bless America. You're never going to get that to happen today. No, you're never going to get that to happen again. But, you know, and and perspective wise, you got to remember too, you know, like before September 12th or 11th, um, you know, it was, it was partisan BS um, as well. Um, You know, that's always going to be the thing. So, um, you know, I think that's always going to exist. I, what makes me sad, though, for today is, um, uh, I don't know, just I uh, people don't know who to trust anymore. And, that, and I think that's that causes a lot of concern. Uh, and it makes people angry. It makes them fearful. Everything stems from fear and love. And those are the two powerful, those are the two driving emotions. Everything comes off of those things. So uh, when you, when you can't trust somebody, when you can't, you can't even, you're not even sure if you trust yourself anymore, you know, that causes fear and fear leads to anger and then anger leads to this and blah, blah, blah. So I think that's what's going on right now. But again, I'm, what do I know? You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a yuckster. So, uh, (laughs) uh, but I do think that that, that fear is, is what's got America in its grip right now. And, uh. And like FDR said, you know, the only thing, that's all we have to fear is that. Yeah. Fear is, you know, fear, fear. That, that's the only thing you should be afraid of is, is that. Nothing, the other stuff is, are, are man-made problems when they have man-made solutions. We can figure this stuff out. Um, but if you, if you allow yourself to be wrapped up in fear, uh, the only thing that's going to come from that is more darkness. Yeah. And, and so, so we got to get away from that. Um, I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm, I, wish, I wish from a leadership perspective, you know, I think our I think our best leaders. Um, I wish our best leaders would engage more in public service. I think our our best leaders aren't engaging in public service because why? They're going to be underpaid and abused and pariahs. And you know who wants that when they could stay in the private sector and make a lot of money and and go fly fishing and not have a you know. But unless we get some some of our better leaders in this country to step up and take that leadership those leadership roles, 
I think we're going to continue to, to swim around in darkness. I couldn't agree with you more. Those are, those are wise words. And I, you know, I, um, I belong to a, um, advisory board for a group called with honor. And it's, um, it's a group that, uh, it's a, a political action committee that, um, elects veterans to Congress on both sides, Republicans and Democrats. And, um, they have a, a caucus and they're really pushing towards um, this idea of national service, uh, collective national service for everyone, mandatory national service. And I love this idea that because I've seen for myself, I've seen how service has shaped my life. I watched my dad serve um, active duty growing up and then again, 19 years in the reserves. And, and I knew that every other weekend dad was going to be gone in two days, two weeks, and then another two weeks he would be gone. And that, and, and that was just a part of my life. Right. And, and then watching my brother, but I very much like, I kind of watched them with like, Oh, my family serves, but I didn't have an itch to do anything in terms of public service. I, I had no, um, inkling for doing that myself. I just thought that was kind of my, my family makeup. And, you know, my service was through their service, essentially, frankly. Um, and after Travis was killed, I was a small business owner. I ran clothing boutiques, upscale clothing boutiques. And I was, that was my life's passion was running clothing boutiques. And after he was killed, I, I couldn't even imagine going back to that world. And so I originally, after he was killed, I took a job with the government because I thought, oh, I'll serve by working for the government. I found out very quickly that that wasn't my way to serve. And so I ended up running for public office myself. And to this day, I've been our township supervisor for going on 10 years. And it's given me a way to give back to my community. And, you know, along with what I do professionally every day, working with veterans and families of fallen service members, but I see how it's changed my life, how serving for others has changed the way that I view every single thing that I do. Unfortunately, it took me to, you know, my brother was killed for me to find that. But I think us giving that opportunity to everyone and there's so many different ways that people can serve this country. It's not just putting on a military uniform, but it changes your DNA to some degree. It really does. It changes the way you do everything. I couldn't agree more. I think that's uh, very, everything you said is very true. And there's all kinds of ways to serve. I, I read something, I'll, I'll probably butcher it. So it's, this is all paraphrasing, but um, basically it was just saying like, if you're, if you're, if you're depressed or if you're sad or if you or unmotivated or without purpose or, you know, just a drift or um, just start with a couple things, start with a little bit of gratitude for the things you do have and then start serving others. And it's amazing how fast things will change for the better. Yeah. I say that a lot when to others. Yeah. When I, when I speak to kids, you know, we run a character development program. So we have veterans um, that have been trained in character education and they go out and speak to our nation's youth. We've spoke to and presented this program to over half a million kids across the country. And it's incredible work because you've got these veterans that are coming back and saying, we've taken off our uniform, but they all of a sudden are missing that purpose and that passion. And so we put them back in front and say, we still need you. And this is what we need you to do. But Whenever I have the opportunity, I speak at the Naval Academy to a uh, summer seminar. So it's the kids that are interested in the Naval Academy. And I go every summer and speak to them. And um, uh, I always say, just so you know, this idea of getting out and serving, it's not just for others. It's for you, too. And it's going to feel good. And that's OK to say I serve because it's good for me to serve. You know, don't feel ashamed to say I feel good serving others. So I love that. Um Okay, so I want to get into the journey to becoming Rob Riggle, the comedian. So you take this path, you serve in Afghanistan for two, two tours, you come back, and how quickly do you kind of go back into the normal routine of your acting and comedic um, profession? 
pretty pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, a couple months, I was probably back on stage um, doing doing stuff. Now, I had prior to uh, uh, going back on active duty, you know, I had been doing uh, improv and sketch at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York, um, you know, for many many years. Um, at that point, so uh, um, when I got back, I just kind of joined joined my old improv troupe and went back on stage wrote a new sketch show, did improv shows, kind of got back in the swing of things. And about two years after I got back from Afghanistan, that's when I, I got on Saturday Night Live. So, it, you know, it, it, it was back into, the, back into the grind, so to speak. I think I'd been doing improv for about four or five years, it, you know, improv and sketch for four or five years prior to deployment. Um, and then when I got back another two years of, of grinding. And you know, when I'm saying grinding, I mean 1 a.m. improv jams down in the village for nine drunks in the basement of some black box theater, you know, and the, the people out there weren't even listening, who cares, you know, it's, but you, it's stage time. Right. So you take it, you know, and you do this, you know, you take, it, you take the stage whenever you can get it. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I, I, you know, I was fortunate in the sense that uh, if you, I had um, created uh, enough work, uh, I'd done enough work, done enough grinding that uh, the opportunities started to present themselves. So you get a gig with Saturday Night Live. And I, I imagine as a comedian, like that's, well, as any, I mean, that's big. You're like, whoa. And do you feel like when you land that, do you feel like, okay, I've made it? Is that, do you get that feeling or are you like, uh, you know, I mean, there's two ways you can look at it. I made it or I falsely. Yeah. I falsely had that feeling. Okay. False. Cause see, I was, I was very uh, green, very inexperienced in show business. Now I could, I could go down to the UCB theater and do sketch shows and improv. Like my, my skill set was there, but I had n no one was paying me right. uh, to do any of this. So it wasn't, you know, my first gig in show business, my first job in show business was Saturday Night Live. So talk about jumping into the deep end and, and drinking out of a fire hose. That was, that was, that was it. Yeah. So it was a little overwhelming to say the least when your first gig is SNL and SNL is this very iconic, you know, going on 50 years here uh, or 45 years. The show's been on no 50. I don't know what it has. A long time. Yeah. 45 years. Um, so it's an iconic show, right? It's, it's, it's uh, very big. And I, I foolishly thought, hey, hey, I, I made it. Now I just got to, you know, kick butt here and then I'll be making movies and da, 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 da. And I just, because I was so naive, I was so foolish about it. I just didn't understand. I was a, a, a babe in the woods, really. Um, and, and, you know, I had to grow up real fast because uh, it didn't, it, it lasted for 2004, 2005. So it was one season. Uh, it was an election year. It was when Bush was running against Kerry. Um, and normally SNL gets a big spike in the ratings on an election year because everybody tunes in to see the fake debate. Sure. That stuff, right. For whatever reason, that election did not grab the imagination of the American public. So no one cared, um, and particularly at that election. And so no one tuned in to watch. So they didn't get a big spike in the ratings. So NBC panicked and they were like clean house. So last one in first one out. So that's, I got caught up in that wave of clean them out. Um, so I, I did one year and then at the end of that year, you know, they, they called and said, they're not going to renew your contract. I remember thinking, what? But hold on. I, I've got more to do there. Like I've, I've got all these character ideas. I got all this stuff I want to do. And what I was, I was bewildered. I was actually shocked. Uh, and then I, that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh, there's no finish line in show business. There's no point when you ever, there's no point that you ever get to a place and you go, I'm good. I got it. Now I'm on easy street. Yeah. Even A-listers, even A-listers are competing for the, you know, they're competing for the best movies, the Oscar movies, but they're still competing to get what they want. Um, and, and it, it just never ends. So you realize, Oh, you know, it, it took a re total recalibration. Uh, and, and I had about a, 15 minute pity party where I sat out, I was at my parents' lake house and I sat out back and I felt bad for myself. And I, you know, lamented and moaned and uh, was hurt and uh, felt betrayed and all these, well, you know, 
And then I said, okay, well, I've got a daughter and a wife and I've got to provide. So guess what? That little pity party's over now. So now I got to figure out how to, where are my paychecks coming from? Right. So I just went back to work, you know, go, go back. And I, I went out to Hollywood and I pitched a pilot to NBC. They bought it. So I, was, I wrote it. It didn't get made, but they paid me to write it. So I was like, okay, there's the first paycheck. Now, I'm still in the reserves now at this point. And I'll never forget it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, you have highs and lows in this business. And, and I remember, um, I had, I had started, um, command and staff college, uh, at the time, um, I was a major and it was down at Miramar Marine Corps air station Miramar. And I'm, I'm sitting in the BOQ on a fr- on a Saturday night in these cinder block walls of a rundown BOQ. And I'm, I'm looking around going, and the the premiere of Saturday Night Live is that night. The and following season or your all season? My old castmates. I'm looking at all my friends. And this is the year after. Yes. Okay. So, is, so I had just been let go, you know, a month a month prior. And I'm sitting in the BOQ with my Machiavelli book or whatever I was studying, you know, whatever we were reading, uh, Mahan, Mahomes, or whatever, <laughs> uh, you know, naval warfare. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell happened? I was on that show. I was on that show. <laughs> You know, two months ago, and now I'm I'm in the BOQ uh, studying, uh, you know, command and staff stuff, you know, all weekend. Uh, and I was like, oh God, you know, what did I do wrong? What did I, you know? So it was a, it was a gut check. And those those moments when you are knocked down, um, that's where you, uh, if you have the right mindset, that's where you can focus on character, and that's when you can focus on, okay, well, this happened. It can't unhappen. So what are you going to do about it? And that's, that's, I think that's the difference. Um, I think that's the mindset difference and it can make a big difference in the, in the, what happens in your life. Um, so, so yeah, I, 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 again, you know, you have these, the, you're human. Everybody has these pity parties for a minute. You kind of get down and, but then you, you have to have a conversation with yourself. You can't be afraid to talk to yourself and say, this sucks. I hate this. I don't like this. And, uh, the, you know, I feel bad. I, this hurts. Um, you know, why, why did this happen to me? You know, and, you, and then you go, okay, well, what am I going to do about it? Cause you can't, you know, it's, it's that thing where, what can you control? And if, so if you focus on the right things and you, you, you get busy on those things, uh, all of a sudden things get better. And sure enough, um, you know, I got, I got busy focusing on the right things. I put, I put my hurt in its perspective. I, you know, it's still there. It still annoys me to this day that they let me go. <laughs> still to this sure. day, yeah. it annoys me um, because I, they didn't get to see my best self, and I, I'm mad about that because I, my first year on the show, I did very well. By the way, on the show that first year, considering I was the only new member on the show, um, I did pretty well. I got I got airtime. I got characters on. I did I did what I was supposed to do, um, but I was also operating out of a place of fear. And I, I, I was looking forward to coming back for a second year because I was like, oh, I'm going to. Now, now I'm going to prove it. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm going to lean into it. And, and I never got that opportunity. So it kind of haunts you a little bit. I'm good with it now, so to speak, but it does agitate. But you, you, get, you get your head right. And so I focused on what I could do. And I went back to work. I went back on stage. I went, uh, you know, doing stand up, doing improv, doing sketch. And then I got The Daily Show. And uh, I was very, very fortunate to get The Daily Show. I was running out of money. And again, I have a wife and, and a child that I, I, you know, I'm on the hook for. I got to support them. So I remember, um, it, it, you know, work was lean. And uh, so I was about to actually go back on active duty. Um, I, was, I really was. I was going to volunteer to go back on active duty. Um, and... Uh, I got uh, an audition for the Daily Show. I went in and did it in LA, uh, and then it, it it went well. So they asked me to come out to New York and read with John. Uh, I did, and um, you know there was like four or four of us I think out there at that time trying to get the job. And uh, I think I, I thought I blew the audition, and I remember being on the phone with my wife. Uh, I was out on the street after the audition, and I just said, "Don't worry, don't worry, we're going to be fine." Um, I you know I'm going to go back on active duty. You know, we're going to get paid on the 1st and the 15th. We're going to be fine. You know, this is going to, it's all going to be good. I mean, how funny though, when you think about it, that 
you walk out of an audition with The Daily Show and you're like, all right, I'm either going to do this or I'm going to go back and be a Marine. You know, I mean, I'm going to go back to, like you said, the first and the 15th, or I'm going to continue to keep pushing through this vastly unknown um, professional career because you just don't know what comes next. Um, And I have to imagine, too, when you think about SNL, I have to imagine that they definitely tote the fact that, you know, they got Rob Riggle his start to some degree. You know, the, the, oh, Robert, well, Rob Riegel, you know, he started on Saturday Night Live with us, you know. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I seriously doubt it, though. <laughs> so you uh, get the job with uh, John Oliver. You're on the, but, but that's in New York, right? Right. So you have to relocate back to New York. Yes. Yes. And it was, it was tough because the way The Daily Show works is, um, they do it probationary style. So you get six months to see if it's a good fit. Well, I'm not moving my family from my wife and daughter from California, which we just moved there to New York. And we couldn't even afford New York because it was, it was cable money. So I, I couldn't even, you know, I'd have to live in Jersey or, you know, I'd have to live out somewhere and commute in. Yep. Um, so I was like, no, we're not doing that for six months. Cause what if in six months they go, yeah, it didn't work. Well, you're better prepared for it this time because after the NS- SNL experience, right? Yeah, I learned learned very quickly that there's there's just no guarantees in show business. Things change in a minute. So, uh, and then I, I did the six months and it went well. They said, we like you. You get another six months. So I was like, huh? Okay. So I'm still proving myself. That whole first year was all about proving yourself. Yeah. Um, and you were on probation, you know. So for a year, you know, I was commuting to LA and on the weekends I was, I would come back, I would fly back. Uh, my wife would pick me up um, and with my daughter at the airport and we would drive down to San Diego uh, to Miramar. And I would go to command and staff during the day. I would meet them in the evening. They would go like to Legoland or whatever. Um, and then I would meet them in the evening at the hotel and we'd have dinner and I'd play with my daughter in the pool. And then, um, get her to sleep and then uh, try to spend some time with my wife, have, you know, dinner or whatever, just conversation. And then I would try to study because <laughs> there's always an exam, you know? So I try to study. And then uh, Sunday we, re- we would repeat, you know, and uh, same thing. They'd go do something, SeaWorld or whatever in San Diego, same thing, play in the pool, get, you know, daddy, daughter time. And then uh, we, I'd stay, I'd always take the red eye so I could spend as much time on Sunday with them as possible. And then we drive up back to LAX. I would get on uh, the red eye, fly back to New York, land at JFK Monday morning, take a cab straight to the daily show and go to work. Oh my gosh. And I would do that once a month. Um, and and uh, that was once a month. And then I would also try to get back one other weekend a month where it was just me and the family, you know. Not doing it. was averaging was about two weekends a month. Uh, for for an entire year, um, and then when the Daily Show picked me up for the second year, they were like, "You got a whole year now. Now you got the whole year." So I was like, "All right," um, but that's all they would give me. So I was like, well, "I don't know, you know, like it's still not enough." Right. And I was I wasn't getting paid that much. I mean, I really wasn't getting paid hardly anything. Um, so. Uh, we, we moved the family, my family, back to Kansas City, where her fam- my wife's family's from, is my family's from. Um, uh, she has a good support system there. She has friends and family. Uh, my parents were down on the farm, so the house in Kansas City was empty, so she had a house. Um, and it cut my commute in half. So now instead of flying five hours, I could only, I'd only have to fly two and a half hours to Kansas City. And it made that a lot easier. And we saved a ton of money, uh, which, you know, it was, it was a necessity at the time. Yeah. So, um, so then I did that for another two years, commuting New York to Kansas City. Uh, and then once I was done with The Daily Show, we packed up and I'll move back out to California. We got to imagine that your wife, I mean, on both ends of the spectrum, you know, she, she marries a Marine, which the, the, the spouse of a Marine is not easy. And then she marries the wife of, you know, a sh- 
struggling up and coming comedic actor who, you know, so I mean, probably two of the hardest professions to be married to that person and, and you had them both. And so, um, that definitely had to be a challenge for her. And I always say that, you know, the, the spouses of our service members are by and large, the most underappreciated, um, of anything in our service. Like, and I think, I think it's becoming more, we're putting more emphasis on, on the spouse and the family, but you know, your wife has, uh, been with you through that thick and thin. So that's pretty, uh, incredible. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the spouses of our, our military members, um, they, they endure a lot more than people understand. Yeah. I, I saw it with my mom, you know, for, for many, many years. And I, I didn't give it the appreciation, you know, that it deserved until I was older, but as a young kid, I didn't, I didn't get it. Now as a mother of three, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe everything that she did. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, so you leave the daily show, you do that for a few years. That's a great thing. Um, you have a good time doing that. And then you connect with Will Ferrell because I mean, and I'm, I'm only guessing this because you've done so many movies with him. You had to have connected with him in some way. You know, how does that happen? Yeah, I think, uh, the comedy world is small. It really is. And, and, um, so if you're in it long enough, you, you run into people and you, you get a reputation and people know, you know, if you're funny, if you can be counted on, do you improvise well? Do you do stand up well? What do you do well? And are you someone that you can work with? You know, there's a lot of great comedians out there that are challenging yeah. to work with, <laughs> uh, but they're great comedians, you know, and, and what makes them a great comedian is, you know, probably they're, they're a little tortured on some level. Um, but, you know, you also find out, oh, this person's a, a real pleasure to work with. They're really funny. And, and so uh, being part of the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater was a, a big part of, of connecting with other people. Like m- my teacher at the Upright Citizen Brigade was Amy Poehler. Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I, learned, I learned from one of the best. That's you know? crazy. And, one of the so best. I, Parks and Rec is one of my favorite shows of all yeah, time. She was a great teacher yeah. and, a, and a really great improviser and someone that I love getting on stage with. And, uh, uh, you know, I think when it was, when, when Lauren Michaels went around asking people, who should I be looking at, you know, for cast or whatever, you know, I think it was probably Amy and maybe Horatio Sands and some of these other folks that had maybe put in a good word for me, yeah. um, to, to even get that audition. So, um, yeah, no, I, you know, it's, uh, I think that's how it happened because, you know, again, these, these worlds are very small, you know, you got the Chicago, Improv Olympic, you got the Upright Citizens Brigade, you got the Groundlings, and all, eventually you all kind of cross pollinate in, in, in certain comedy worlds. Um, so, what's your first movie? What is the first movie that that you do? Do you remember? The first, the first movie I did was a, a movie called Unaccompanied Minors, where I played a you know security guard or something. Okay, I, I remember that movie. Um, but that was the first one I did. I didn't do much in it. Um, but then, uh, the hangover, um, was, was fun. It's funny too, cause Todd Phillips, who directed that, who also went on to direct Joker this past year, I think he was nominated for an Oscar and stuff. He was a big UCB guy. He used to hang out at the UCB in New York back in the, back in the early two thousands, you know? And, and so, um, and you get that role and you're the cop, um, yeah. in the hangover that, um, that has the little girl tase um, Bradley Cooper, right? And um, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And and it's funny because uh, you came to our the Travis Manning Foundation. You were the the master of ceremonies at our gala a couple years ago, and um, I can attest for you are great off the cuff. I mean, we gave you a very dry script because it was a serious event, but we asked you to, you know, to bring a little bit of humor and levity to the, to the, um, event. And you were amazing. And I tell you that all the time, every year, when I ask you to come back and do it again, I'm like, you were the best. Everybody loved you. And, but I remember when, um, I shared with some people leading up 
I said, oh, you know, we have Rob Riggle as our, our MC this year. And they were like, oh, Rob Riggle. I said, yeah, he's a, he's an actor. He's, oh, okay. And then I say, you know, the guy from Step Brothers who says this is better than any Catalina wine mixer I've ever been to. And they're like, oh my God, Rob Riggle. And I, I read in an article about you that you are described as an actor who has a knack for turning small parts in big films into everyone's favorite part of the movie. And it is so true. Like when you think back on all these iconic comedies, your role in that movie is like as as little as it may be or as big as it may be, it's always like, oh my God, that's the scene that people talk about. And um, I'm sure you hear that all the time. That's very kind of you to say. I honestly, I give credit to uh, uh, the uh, other actors and the director for letting me improvise um, because that's a lot of that stuff, just improvising and having fun um, because I do that better sometimes delivering improvised lines than the scripted lines. Not that the scripted lines aren't funny or whatever. It's just when it's your own verbiage, it comes out better. Sometimes. Oh, totally. And I can, I, I can only imagine, you know, you came to the, the year before that before you came and emceed our gala, you actually, I met you at Army Navy, at the Army Navy football game. You were doing a, um, you had We Are the Mighty, we're following you around doing a documentary uh, or a little video on you because I think you had 12 strong coming out at the time. Um, right. And that was, that was a dramatic performance, which is it, you know, you are not just a comedic actor. You also, uh, and that, that movie did really well. That was a great movie. Um, and I met you, you came over to our tailgate because our mutual friend, Chase Millsap, um, he told me, Oh, I'm, I'm following Rob Riggle around. I said, well, you got to bring him to our tailgate. We have the biggest and the best tailgate at the whole, yeah. at the, at, at army Navy. And you came and I remember you jumped up on top of the, um, you were so gracious. You jumped up on top of the pickup truck that we had. And we had Vince Papali there, who was uh, the movie Invincible was was uh, made after his story. And he's a Philadelphia legend, a former Eagles player. And you jumped up and you shot that line out from Step Brothers. And we have it on. I mean, I say we have it on camera. We have it on like iPhone camera. But the crowd literally like went wild when it's snowing everybody's there amped up for the game. And, you know, for those who have not been to army Navy, I don't think there's any better, um, athletic sports game in ever. I mean, it is, it's, it's everything. It's, it's a special day. It's a sure. special day. Yes. And, um, made more special last year when Navy finally came back and, um, and won the game after uh, after a few years of devastating losses. So um, we, we were on a hot run though for a long time. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you this. It was what th was it like thirteen years in a row that yeah. that Navy had yeah. won. And I remember going into that last year that we won before we we took off a, a few years. And I was like, oh, you know, I mean, I kind of feel bad for Army, you know. And somebody was like, what do you mean you feel? But no, you do not feel bad for Army. You, you never say anything like that. And those three years that Army won back to back to back, they rubbed it in our faces so bad that when we won this year, when Navy won this year, I, I held nothing back in, a, you know, I was, I was a, not a um, gracious winner by any way, shape or form. So it amazed me too. I, you know, Army wins those three in a row, and, I'm, and they 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 were very uh, uh, boisterous in their uh, uh, celebration. And I remember thinking, how quickly they forgot the last thirteen years. Yeah, you know, 13, <laughs> thirteen or whatever it was. It was some big number like that. Yep. But they had instantaneously forgot it, as if woohoo, you know. And I was like, oh, so anyway, it's it's all, it makes it fun. It makes it part of the the experience. Well, it's a great rivalry, and it is. It's it's. Events like that, going to events like that, the the camaraderie, the shared camaraderie and that you feel um, never will you go to a, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong, diehard, season ticket holding Eagles fan. 
there's no shared camaraderie with when you come to play the Eagles. I mean, when people talk, when I tell people I'm an Eagles fan, I kind of say it like, yeah, I'm an Eagles fan, but you know, we're, we're terrible humans as fans. I mean, I know we are, I've been at the games, my kids, my husband won't even take our kids to the games, you know, because our seats are not in a section where he wants them hearing what the people around us are saying. But, you know, you go to an army Navy game and it's all in jest because at the end of the day, you know, we call it, it's America's game. Uh, they're on that field. They're competing against each other, but then they're going to turn around and they're going to be serving our country together uh, once they walk off that field. So, so there's just such a beautiful symbolism in, in what that game represents. And there, there is. And even though the rivalry is intense and both sides are passionate about their teams, they don't do it. Um, in a uh, degrading way towards the other team. I mean, the worst it gets is beat Army, go Navy. Right. right? It's not like, you know, uh, other rivalries you see where it gets really unhinged. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that, you know, Army wants to win so bad they can taste it. Same thing with Navy, same thing with their fans. But we all, everybody in that stadium has perspective. You know what I mean? Uh, they did, they haven't lost sight of the big picture. Yes, uh, that's that's such a great point. Perspective. They have not lost perspective, and I think that you know I go to those games and um, and I think about again that shared humanity that we can find when you're at events like that, where you see the best of what our country has to offer, and and it's these fine young men and women that um, that are doing so much. So it's incredible. You're incredible. Um, I am such a huge fan of all of the work you do. Um, you know, we, 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 we didn't even get into, I think I'd love for you to, before I ask you your final question, I'd love for you to tell us what you're up to these days, this, these days. Um, I know you've got a show on right now. I've watched it. It's really funny. It's a bunch of celebrities playing putt putt called holy moly um celebrity but yes well well tell us a little bit anything else that you have in the works anything else you want to tell us about um there's uh uh, so holy moly on abc thursday nights um i'm doing that i'm actually going to go down and do holy moly australia in september um that'll be fun going down to australia to do that um i have a a, an animated series coming out on netflix called hoops um it's it's an r-rated it's animated but it's r-rated so don't let the kids okay um it's it's an r it's a a very clear r (laughs) Uh, but it's hilarious and it'll be a really fun show um so that's coming out in in august uh and um and then there's a couple other things that are out there on the horizon but this covid you know it really is it's kind of locked up a lot of production so Everybody's waiting, you know, to kind of get this out of the way so that we, we can get the wheels of industry, so to speak, moving again. Um, and then, then, then I might have more to report. But awesome. Right now those are the primary things. Well, we'll bring you back on when, uh, when everything starts opening up and you can share some big news with us. But, um, Rob, I want to thank you so much. I want to ask you one final question. It's the question that we ask everyone as they leave the Resilient Life podcast, and that is, what does living a resilient life mean? look like for you living a resilient life uh it means um it means moving forward it means getting up when you're knocked down because if you think you're going to get through this life without getting knocked down you are fooling yourself you're going to get knocked down and i don't whatever in whatever form it takes and that's what you don't know you don't know how you're going to get knocked down but you're going to get knocked down And the resilient life is taking that deep breath, standing back up and re-engaging. And that is hard to do, but it's also what makes life um, pretty special. Absolutely. Getting back up, keep moving forward. Wise words from Rob Riggle. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Our guest today, Rob Riggle, was fantastic. Hearing about his journey from Marine Corps to comedic actor and his wise, sage advice to keep moving forward. 
I want to thank all of you for listening and please be sure to subscribe, like, and share the Resilient Life podcast with your family and friends.